This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Hello, everyone. In the video I made just before the last one I made, I spoke about our daily bread and how Jesus and the New Testament scriptures show us that our daily bread isn't wonder bread from Walmart, but God's wonder bread, his will for us each day, what he wants his servant to do for this particular day. Your kingdom come, your will be done, give us this day our daily bread. This is the bread we feed upon to have eternal life. Bread for eternal life, doing the will of the Father. We are servants in the household of God. And as servants in the household of God, we want to know our daily duties, which is our bread for eternal life, the will of God. God's kingdom and his righteousness must be our top priority over and above everything else we have or anything else we do. Everything. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Make disciples. Jesus taught plainly that there's a high cost to discipleship. So count the cost. Do we want to be genuine disciples or pretenders? Fake disciples. Is there any point in being a fake Christian? Or are we just deluding ourselves when we're pretenders? This dark world is full of lies and full of liars. Men who believe their own lies because they love the world much more than they love God. In the worldly church system, the harlot, it is very common for people to think they can fake it, but their faith is just lip service to God, and they aren't fooling anyone but themselves. It's just lip service to God, and their hearts are far from him. They say they believe. They say they trust, but they show that they really don't by hedging their bets. They say they trust, but they really don't. So they hedge their bets. They delude themselves into believing they can custom design their own salvation plan to suit themselves, prioritizing as they please according to their own design and their own schedules. They think they get to decide how and when they will be God's servant, meanwhile getting what they want from this world, and that they can just fit Christ into their plan when they have the time. 
They think they can collect all their worldly things and just add Christ to the bottom of their list of worldly things. Once they have all their own worldly priorities satisfied. And so they delude themselves into supposing they can add the kingdom of God and his salvation to their worldly possessions. Adding the kingdom of God to their mammon. So Christ and God's salvation become an addition to their collection of things, their treasures on earth that they have acquired for themselves, their mammon. And so in their deluded insanity, they suppose they can add God to their mammon. You cannot serve both God and mammon. There won't be any fakers or pretenders entering the kingdom of God. If we truly want to be a part of that kingdom, we need to be genuine disciples, not fakers, not pretenders. We must walk in truth by the spirit of truth, the spirit our God gives to us, our Father gives to us, his good gifts to his children. For those who are truly led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. They will all be taught by God, who gives us his Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to walk by. Pretenders like to think they can just hang around that narrow gate. Jesus said you have to pass through the narrow gate. They like to pretend they can just hang around that gate just as long as they're just across the line on the inside. And they stay there so that they might jump back to the other side and into the world whenever it pleases them. But there's no fence sitting in the kingdom of God. The devil, he's just going to come and push you off into the darkness. The few who have went through that gate have went onward and are on their journey on that narrow and difficult way that leads to life. But this walk is not something which is by our own design. The way of salvation is not for us to design for ourselves a life that we design for ourselves as many in the worldly church system suppose, deluding themselves. They think they can prioritize their lives how they please. They'll get their careers first. They'll get their jobs first. They'll get their families together and their cars. And once they have all their possessions, I'll add God's salvation ticket to my collection of worldly things, my mammon. In the worldly church system, they read their Bibles and suppose it is then, now all up to them to do as Jesus was teaching. They'll decide how and when. They will decide how and when they will accomplish those teachings. And after they are done with all their worldly priorities, and collecting all their worldly stuff, they might find time to fit God and his kingdom into their schedules. Not so with genuine disciples of Jesus. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, it literally says soul there, even his own soul, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot 
be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and count the cost? Consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, None of you can be my disciple who does not forsake all his own possessions, yea, even his own life. Luke fourteen twenty six to 33. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not forsake all his own possessions. All your worldly stuff. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I hate to have to say this, but I do. This doesn't mean you should drop everything, walk out your front door and abandon everything right now and put God to the test to see if he will come up with the goods. You remember when Jesus was tempted and how he responded. He did not put God to the test. Neither should you. You are the servant. God is not there to respond to you and your decisions. You are there as his servant to respond to him and his decisions. So do not put God to the test to see if he will respond to you and your decisions. Don't be a dimwit. Yes, if you truly follow Jesus and walk in his footsteps, your day will come. And the Lord will let you know when and how to leave all behind. But you must be responding to the Lord and not expecting it to be the other way around. Do not put God to the test. The Lord decides what you will do and when you will do it, not you. None of you can be my disciple who does not forsake all his own possessions. To follow Jesus means forsaking everything in this world, including our own life. Everything. Jesus is not kidding. And he means business. His father's business. We'll come back to this. Mammon. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. No one can serve two masters or he will hate the one and love the other. Which treasure do you love? He will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus made that pretty clear. Treasures on earth, mammon. What is mammon? It's one's worldly wealth, material wealth, their personal prosperity without qualification of quantity. It doesn't mean riches in terms of excessive wealth. 
Jesus didn't say, don't store up too much treasure on earth. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. He's not talking about excessive wealth. It's not riches in terms of excessive wealth, but whatever wealth someone happens to have. Sustenance for their lives. Mammon for your worldly life. Like all the people of the world, this is what they're looking for. This is their priority. Their careers, their jobs, their education, their cars, their houses, all their stuff. This is what Jesus is getting at here. Where is your priority? You cannot serve God and mammon. His point is not that this is not allowed, as if this were some kind of commandment. He is teaching us this is impossible to accomplish. You cannot serve both God and mammon. It's just not going to work. If you try this, and the worldly church system does, they take Jesus up on his challenge, you will fail because there will be a conflict of interest. When one master wants you to do X, but the other wants you to do Y, two masters, then you must choose to serve one master and deny the other master. So if you serve mammon, you'll end up denying God. In the worldly church, most don't believe Jesus here. And they think they can do both. They can serve God, and they can store up treasure on earth, and they can have their mammon. But if you decide that you will prove Jesus wrong and attempt to serve both, you will end up loving one master to serve and hating the other master to serve. So what will be the result for you if you end up serving mammon? You will end up loving mammon and being devoted to mammon and hating God and despising God. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Do not. Pretty clear. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Did he make it clear enough? Why? You will hate the one and love the other. That's where you'll end up. You'll end up in a dilemma someday where you have to choose. And if you're serving mammon, you'll end up denying God and his will. Jesus made himself very clear. Plain as can be. Few will hear him and listen to him. Here's another thing that people try in the worldly church system. Do not store up for yourselves too many treasures on earth, but take the time to also store up for yourselves treasures in heaven too. No one but the people in our church can serve two masters, or he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can serve God and mammon if you do it my way or our church's way. These are the kind of games people play in their heads and end up deluding themselves and feeding on their own lies, and they believe their own lies. Something like that. 
In the worldly church, it is routine for their disciples to delude themselves something like this. And so make themselves fakers and pretenders. Fake disciples. I did it my way instead of doing it the Lord's way. Jesus made it pretty clear. But people in the worldly church system think, well, you know, I think I can do it my way better than Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? It's absurd to call Jesus Lord and not do what he says. If he's the Lord, you're the servant, and you do what he says because that's what servants do, what their Lord says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Do not store up for yourselves too many treasures on earth. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I say? Only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. What words? All the things he taught in the Sermon on the Mount including Matthew 6, 19 to 24. If you don't do what he says there, you're not doing the will of God, and you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It couldn't be plainer. So let's look at something else here. If you go to Bible Gateway and you're reading Matthew 6, and you pull up the NIV version, you might see something that looks like this. Now notice all those headings. What does that make it look like? It makes it look like Jesus is firing out these random teachings, doesn't it? I'm going to teach you about fasting. Okay, I'm going to change the subject now. I'm going to change, change the subject and teach you about treasures in heaven. Okay, I'm done with that. Now I'm going to teach you something else, not to worry. See how it does that to you? That's not what's going on here, man. And even if you turn off those headings, which you can do, you, it's still all broken up like this. It's still a bit of a problem. So I switched to the KJV here, just for illustration. Notice the passage we were just reading at verse 24. You cannot serve God and mammon. Notice what it says in the next verse. Therefore. Therefore. What is the word therefore? Therefore. It means, because of what I just said, therefore, I say to you. And you might miss that because of the way these translations cause you to think. You know, it makes it look like Jesus got all these broken up teachings that he's firing off. It isn't like that at all. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or what you shall wear. All right? Be aware of that. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then it literally says in verse 25, because of this, because of what? Because of what? You cannot serve God and mammon. Because of this, because of what? 
Do not store up treasure on earth. You cannot serve God and mammon. Because of this, and then he teaches, don't worry about what you're e eating or what you're going to be wearing. God will take care of that. Because you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Because of this, all right, mammon, material stuff the world seeks to have for their lives. Worldly prosperity, no matter what level of prosperity you might have. Because of this, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will where? And Jesus says a whole bunch of stuff about that. And then he says, For the nations eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. We need to eat. We need to have clothes. And we need to have shelter, especially if we live in Canada in January. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mammon. Do not worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. Worry about your daily bread, doing the will of God. The Father knows you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God will take care of it. And Jesus explains that if you read the whole thing. God takes care of the birds of the air etc. He'll take care of you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Do you really trust God? Do you really trust that he does indeed care for you? Or do you kind of hedge your bets? Maybe God won't come up with the goods. So my priority is going to be getting my food, getting my clothes, getting my shelter, etc., my worldly mammon, and then I'll find time for God. Then, once I get my other stuff, I'll add God and his kingdom and my salvation ticket to my stuff. You really trust him then? Because Jesus teaches God will provide for you, but don't put God to the test. Notice how he finishes off. So do not worry about tomorrow. How did he start? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, why do you do that? Because of tomorrow. You're worried about what you're going to eat tomorrow and the clothes you're going to buy tomorrow, and so on and so on. Jesus said not to worry about it. Trust your Father. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all this will be added to you. Don't worry about mammon. Notice also what he said. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, why did he say that? If you truly follow Jesus and do God's will, you will have more significant problems to worry about. Through many tribulations must we enter the kingdom of God. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Not only must we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness as our top priority over and above everything else, 
we will have trouble and tribulation in this world for doing so. Suffering at the hands of the world is par for the course when you follow Jesus. Just look at what happened to Jesus for serving God. They persecuted him, and ultimately, they put him on a cross and killed him. It's par for the course for following Jesus. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Worry about that. Be concerned about that. If you truly follow Jesus and do God's will, you will have more than enough to worry about. So do not worry about food and clothes. Our Father will take care of us. You cannot serve God and mammon because of this. Do not worry about what you'll eat and what you'll wear. Don't be concerned about mammon. Because you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to get your priorities straight. Otherwise, mammon will be your master instead of God. Serving God rather than mammon means seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness as your priority over everything else. Everything. Not seeking food and clothes as your top priority. And that's what most people do. They think they got to hedge their bets. So they make their top priority, their college education, their careers, acquiring a wife or a husband, children, getting their cars, getting their house, Maybe a whole bunch of other stuff, and then when it's all done, eh, maybe I need to add a salvation ticket and some fire insurance to my collection of things. And in the worldly church system, you see that quite a bit. You see, once people have all these things, that they come back to church. Maybe they went to church when they were young and then they kind of disappear for a while because, you know, they got their priorities, right? Getting their education, getting their career and all that stuff. And then when they're in their mid-30s, maybe late 30s, and they got their family and they got all their stuff, ah, oh, man, I better get my salvation ticket and fire insurance. I better go to church. Right? We all know it's true. That's their top priority, their mammon. And so they think they can add the kingdom of God and his salvation as an add-on to their mammon, their collection of worldly stuff. Be concerned about seeking and serving God, not about seeking your mammon, and thereby end up serving mammon, what you will eat and what you will wear and your cars and your house and everything else. Jesus did not teach to make God and his kingdom a priority in your life. Something to put on your priority list, and it usually ends up at the bottom, but the top priority, and really your only priority. Doing God's will must always take precedence over anything else in your life. And he decides when and how, what you will do, not you. He does that by his spirit, which he gives to us. If you are led by the spirit to do X, you must do X. You're the servant. And not instruct God that you might get to it later, if you have time after serving your worldly priorities, collecting mammon. You must seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus is teaching that you must be all in 
all in, all in or nothing, all in or nothing. There's no halfway. It's all or nothing. That's what he's teaching. He wants genuine followers only. No fake Christianity. No lip service faith or trust. No doing things your way when you want and how you want. No pretenders allowed. The works of God are works which he prepares, not you. This isn't something you decide by your own design. Those who are led by the Spirit do the works of God when he decides and how he decides. This passage belongs to what the worldly church calls the hard sayings of Jesus. And to them, it's hard because they love their mammon. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You see what Jesus is saying to him there? He's saying like, oh yeah, you sure you want to follow me? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I will follow you wherever you go. Notice what Jesus is talking about. The kingdom of God. What is he talking about at Matthew 6? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. I will follow you wherever you go. Oh, you will, will you? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you sure you want to come along? Are you sure you want to follow me? I will follow you wherever you go. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you sure you want to follow me wherever I go? And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom. And another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus does not mince words. It's all or nothing. And what he means by putting his hand to the plow is you don't start and stop and look back. Do not turn your face back to Egypt like the Israelites did. The kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom. Do you see the problem here? Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Okay, I'll come, Jesus, but uh, I got some priorities to take care of here. See that? And the other, I will follow you, Lord, but first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. I want to take care of my worldly priorities first. You see how Jesus is saying, no way. 
No way. If you don't value God and his kingdom any more than that, no way, man. You're, you're just showing me that your worldly priorities have a much higher value to you than God and his kingdom. He does not mince words about this. Permit me first to go and bury my father. But first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said, no way. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't leave much to the imagination here. You see the problem? Both of these guys were not putting the kingdom of God first. They were putting their worldly priorities first. You cannot serve God and mammon. Because of this, don't worry about what you'll eat and wear. That worldly stuff. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. God knows you need them. He'll provide. But don't worry about them. Get your priority right. Don't be like these two other guys here. And that seemed pretty important to go bury your father. Jesus said, that's a worldly priority. No worldly priorities whatsoever. None can get in the way of seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It has to be your top priority and your only priority. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. What were we just talking about? Let me bury my father, right? Let me say goodbye to my family at home, right? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus wasn't going to let or allow people to add following him to their worldly priorities. It's all or nothing. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his soul will lose it. And he who has lost his soul for my sake will find it. Pretty clear, man. He who loves father or mother more than me. Do you remember what he said in Luke 14? Same sort of idea. You cannot serve two masters or you will love one and hate the other. Right? You can't have your family saying, we want you to do this. This ought to be your priority. And then over here, God's saying, no, I want you to do this. You can't juggle those, man. It's not going to work. Sooner or later, you're going to have a conflict, conflict of interest, and you're going to have to choose between one or the other. Not worthy of me. Not fit for the kingdom of God, as Jesus also said in Luke 9. You must pick up your cross. Each day will have enough trouble of its own. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Cannot. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. None of you can be my disciple who does not forsake all his own possessions. You have to leave the world behind. Totally. No carrying some secret idols in your pocket. You're now serving God. Leave everything behind. 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. This was an ancient Jewish way of contrasting preference of choice, kind of hyperbolic way. In contrast to following Jesus, you hate your family. And it doesn't really mean you hate your family and not love them. We're supposed to even love our enemies. It's talking about what you're going to be doing. Are you going to be serving your family? Or are you going to be serving me and following me? You see the contrast there? And Jesus makes it more clear to our modern minds when he says, He who loves father or mother more than me, see his preference of choice, is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yes, and even his own life. You have to hate even your own life, your own worldly existence. If you don't, you cannot be his disciple. Forget it. All or nothing. So count the cost. All or nothing. He who has found his soul or life will lose it. And he who has lost his soul, life for my sake, will find it. In Matthew 6, when Jesus is talking about, don't worry about what you'll eat or drink, it doesn't say uh, literally, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about your soul, what you'll eat or drink. And then he says, don't worry about your body, what you will wear. You might want to think about that. He who has found his soul will lose it, and he who has lost his soul for my sake will find it. You have to hate even your own soul. You have to deny yourself to follow Jesus. And that's exactly what he did during his walk. He says, I do not seek my own will. I do not glorify myself. I only do what my father wants. And let him be glorified. And so in Gethsemane, he says, not my will, but yours, Father. Not my will. And if we follow Jesus, that's where we are. Do not worry about your soul, what you will eat. Don't worry about it. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Cannot. Hopefully that's clear to you. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Boy, does he make it clear, abundantly clear. The truth is, most refuse to hear him. They'll nullify what he says, distort what he says. They don't really care what Jesus says. They'll say they believe in him because they think this delusional process will get them saved. But if they don't even believe what he said, how can they say they believe in him? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? None of you can be my disciple who does not forsake all his own possessions. What does every human cherish the most, or almost every human? His life, even his own life. You must be all in, all in. Even your most dearest thing, you must deny your own life. None of your worldly possessions, including your own life, can take priority over the kingdom of God, including food, clothing, and shelter. 
So don't worry about your life. Is that what Jesus did? Sure is. He did the will of God unto death. He never hedged his bets, ever. He trusted God totally, even when faced with a torturous death as a criminal. He trusted his God. And look at the result for Jesus. Do you trust God? Do you trust that your Father will follow through? You must be all in. You must hate even your own life. The only thing that can matter to you is seeking first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Following Jesus and walking in his footsteps. Because that is what Jesus was doing during his ministry. That's what he was doing. He was seeking first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, not his own will, not his own glory, nothing of himself. He denied himself completely. And if you follow him, that means walking in his footsteps, doing the same thing. Christ in you leading you and guiding you. That is why God gives us his spirit, the same spirit he gave Jesus at the Jordan River. The same spirit in which comes the same word of truth that leads us into all the truth. You must be all in. You cannot serve God and mammon. If you think you can, you're deluding yourself. Jesus said you can't. You can't say you believe in Jesus on one hand and deny him on the other. That's insanity. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Nothing else matters, including your own life. You must be committed to this end. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own souls, even unto death. That's what Jesus is getting at. Even his own life. That's what these people did at Revelation 12, 11. And every disciple he calls, he calls to this. They did not love their own souls or lives until death. You must hate your own soul, Jesus teaches. You must love following Jesus more than your own soul, than your own life. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. You must be all in. All or nothing. Nothing else matters, including your own life. Discipleship means forsaking everything in this world, this dark world. This world is in evil. Not so with the kingdom of God. Where do you want to be? Now, why would anyone choose such a thing? to take up your cross and suffer and lose your own life. And then there's all these worldly comforts you could have. Why would anyone choose this? If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his soul, will lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. For whoever wants to save his soul must pick up their cross, must deny themselves. If you want to save your soul, you must lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. Here is why we must forsake everything in this world. 
What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? This is why. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? You cannot serve God and mammon. You must deny all that is in the world, including your own life. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Notice what it says here. Whoever wants to save his soul, verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will then repay every man according to his deeds. He's not kidding. That is the consistent testimony of Scripture. It says this many, many times. Everyone will be judged for what they have done. And that's why you need to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. His righteousness, not yours. Your works are filthy rags. You must seek his righteousness, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared. Not that we prepare, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How are you going to do these works? You're just going to decide how to do that and fit it into your schedule? That ain't going to happen, man. This is being led by the Spirit to do the fruit of the Spirit, to do God's works when he wants, how he wants. Why? So that in him, Christ, we might become, become the righteousness of God. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. You cannot serve God and mammon. We must seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness above all else. For this is the bread of God, doing the Father's will for eternal life. Worldly mammon contributes absolutely nothing toward our salvation, does it? Therefore, nothing else matters but always seeking to serve God first and foremost, over and above absolutely everything else. Nothing can get in the way. Nothing. If we want to be saved, we must deny ourselves and our own lives, take up our cross, surrender to God and his righteousness, just as Jesus did. Yield up your bodies as living sacrifices to God. Here you go, Father. Do whatever you want with me. That's what you're called to do. That's quite different than you deciding what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, and how you're going to do it your way. And you'll fit God into the schedule meh, somewhere, right? The worldly church system will teach you that you can indeed serve both God and mammon. More or less implicitly, they do this. You have been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31-meter band. 
WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.